Well, hello. My name's Dave Holman, and in the next 60 minutes or so, we want to take you eel fishing on lakes. Now, in a previous video, we actually looked at eel fishing in canals, where location is fairly straightforward. Now, on the lakes, it is that much more difficult. So we've got three different situations that we're going to go through, three different uh, fishing venues. One, we're going to look at uh, fishing at quite long range, and we're going to use ground bait to bring the eels into the area. And this means fishing for quite long periods. The second one is a straightforward night session where we're going to be moving in just as it goes dark to try and intercept eels that are coming into the margins to feed at night. And the third one is where we're looking for a definite feature like a drop off in a lake and we're going to use dead baits to try and catch the eels there again during the night time. We've come to a location in Shropshire, a lake in Shropshire and the big problem here we've got a, a 60 to 80 acre water exactly where we're going to find the eels. Now on a canal that's fa fairly straightforward. We know pretty well precisely where they're going to be and we can lay the baits for them. But on a water of this size, uh, you're guessing to be fair. Now I've chosen a spot here where in the past I've certainly caught good eels and what happens is the, the depth of the water varies considerably in front of us. We've got fairly shallows off to the right hand side. It's down to about uh, 10, 12 foot on that side. As it moves across increases depth till we've got 35 foot on this side. Now most times of the year we're going to have fish somewhere in one of the lo those locations. It's up to us to find them. So we could come here, we could simply put the rods in and work across and try and locate one or two fish. Now it's a bit hit and miss for me and what I like to do is to ground bait to either get the fish used to the baits that I'm using or in effect to attract them into the area. You put them in for long enough and usually you'll find that you bring something in. Now, also, other fish can have an effect as well. We can, we can be getting roach or we can perch, uh, bream, tench, whatever. They can be moving into the area that we're pre-baiting. Now, that's all to the good. The more fish that we draw in, the more chance we've got of actually picking that eel up as well. So I'm talking about quite a bit of bait. and. Uh, what I like to do is put somewhere in between two and three pints of maggots in as a filling if you like and uh, somewhere in the region of 200 worms and that goes in twice a day. So that's quite a bit of bait uh, which we're putting into the marker. So we, we, we put the marker in, in the sort of location that we want to, want to be fishing and then we, we put this ground bait usually on a line. In this particular swim we'll be putting it in a line in front of us across the swim to try and attract eels into the area, eels in, or indeed other fish as well, uh, in, into the area there. So that's the first, that's the first stage. Now, this particular area of the lake, there's a lot of um, snags, stones, abrasive material, roots round about. So we're using quite heavy tackle. Also, we're casting quite some distance. We're going 60, 70 yards out into the lake. So we need fairly heavy tackle. And we're looking, we'll look more closely at the terminal rigs, but basically it consists of one and a half to two and a half ounce leads, eight to 11 pound line, and the stepped up cart rods, two, two, two and a half pound test curve is the sort of equipment that we're using. Also. The reels, which are my favourite, the old three, Mitchell 306s, the bigger bait runners would probably do the, uh, the job well, but on this very heavy line at such a long range, we need to have that big spool. Such reels as the Mitchell 300s and the smaller ones just don't do the job adequately. So we need those, those bigger type of reels. Bite alarms, simple enough. We've got um, the AJS gripper alarms, which uh, once they go off, they keep sounding until you take some action. Now, again, we'll, we'll probably look at those a little bit later on. On top of that. Now, the big thing is we're ground baiting twice a day. 
we put the bait out, we put the ledges out on them, is in effect to not give up. You've got to keep trying over a long session, maybe a weekend. You've got to try and just take one or two fish, perhaps a little bit more than that out during the weekend. And we're just looking for, really for that one big one. So the name of the game is Perseverance. And basically you can catch the fish as, as easily in the daytime as you can at night. Now night fishing, most people when they think of eels think of night time. Now the daytime you're just as likely to catch a big eel in this sort of situation in the daytime as you are at night time. So what we do is we tend to get the sleeping snatches, usually three and four hours, two, three, four hours at a time, and uh, and they come out at key at key times, which certainly first as it breaks light, early afternoon is quite a good time to be fishing, and of course as it's going dark. So those sort of periods and cat naps basically in between. You can get your sleep when you're back at work, can't you? I mean that's the that's the thing on that. So keep at it, keep trying, and keep changing the baits. And in this spot from the shallows through the deeps, so we can be working the baits across different time of days. And the other thing to watch for, when certainly when you, you're in fishing for quite long periods, is that the weather changes. Suddenly the wind will turn round, suddenly it'll cloud over, suddenly it may get sunny. All these different conditions, and it only takes one big eel to suddenly come across your worm in a feeding, uh, yeah, while he's feeding, and that'll make your weekend. So that's the sort of thing that uh, we've got to keep going. Perseverance is the name of the game. Don't just give up because the first day and the night have been a blank. Keep going, keep trying. Now we can catch eels here probably through from the start of the season, the middle of June, and we can probably still pick them up into the early weeks in October. But obviously between those times there's going to be a great deal of uh, diverse conditions. Now the thing that we don't want when we're, we're fishing is dead still, uh, is, is the dead still no wind con, con, uh, condition, especially at night when we've got clear skies. The chances are uh, you, you can hear the, mouse, the mice running about on the other bank, it gets that quiet. And those seemingly, are, they, they, the, time, the chances are that you're going to have a pretty thin time of it trying to catch fish under those conditions. What you need, or what I find is the best, is when we've got overcast, uh, probably some wind blowing, and hopefully warm. If you seem to be comfortable, the fish seem to come as well. So um, that's the sort of thing. That's the sort of thing I'm looking for. If conditions get really bad, and I'm talking about heavy, very heavy rain and wind, etc., then the best thing to do is to reel the rods in and retreat back into the into the bivy, which we've got over there. And, and simply survive and hopefully conditions will change and then you come back out and, and have another crack at them. During the long sessions, uh, during the really nice weather, hopefully in the June, July time, I like to just leave the bed chair right by the rods. A little bit later on in the year, very cold nights, etc., the bivy usually goes up round the... Now this is a waterproof, waterproof job and uh, inside we've got the bed chair and a down fill sleeping bag. Now that's, I find that's quite important because if conditions get really bad at least you've got somewhere to retreat to and you're going to be able to survive for another day. Uh, some of the items of gear here, we look at the landing net which is very big, in fact I won't think you need a net of this sort of size for any other fish apart from eels. You can't afford to miss miss them at the net. That's the most dangerous time, or most likely time to lose the fish. With this one, cuts the number of losses right down to a minimum. 48 inch arms, and uh, I don't miss very often with that. Now, having caught the eel, hopefully, we'll put them in a keep net here. Keep the top well high of the water. That is most important because the eels can, in effect, they can slither up and out. In the daytime, when we've got the sun on it here, well, what we would do then is to try and shade it somewhere if we've got eels, if we're keeping them any length of time, uh, perhaps for a photograph. We try and put it somewhere in the shade, obviously, that, to, that way we'll keep the eels in the best sort of condition and try and peg it out so that uh, it's not all bunched up as it is at the moment. A 
let's have a look at the at the ground bait that we're going to be using. Just ordinary maggots there, a couple of tins full of those probably do the job. And uh, for the worms, we'll be looking at, well, there's probably a hundred there, ready to go in. We'd probably double that amount, basically uh, we want to give it a, a good a good tin full, or a good bait tin full, uh, for, for ground bait. And these will last quite some time on the, on the bottom there, hopefully not that long and that the eels will come in and pick them up. Very difficult to collect large amounts of worms um, for a session like this and you'd be looking at upwards of a thousand worms and that takes quite a bit of getting. Um, right, there's not very many out tonight. What we're looking for normally is the, the grass should be damp, nice damp night and uh, hopefully without too much wind and then the worms will come out in swarms and you can pick them up in, in large numbers. If you guess. We're a bit thin on the ground at the moment, so perhaps we'll have to come back a little bit later. And there's a few more out. So you can see it's quite simple. On the right night, just wonder about, this one's a cricket pitch. Hope none of the uh, committee members are watching this. But uh, the parks, anywhere where there's a nice lawn, then the chances are you'll find there's lobworms out in number. Now to get the amount that you need takes a lot of practice. Because we're looking at, uh, for our session, to use several hundred on each baiting up. So as you can appreciate at this rate, we're here for the night. If you get a nice, really damp night, especially if it hasn't rained for a while in this early summer, the worms aren't usually so bothered about the torchlight and they're that much easier to get hold of. You see that one there, very, very quick to retreat. Actually the worms come to the surface to mate, but on a night like this I don't think I'd like to lie there for long trying to mate actually. Find one or two more. Just lift gently and draw it from the hole. Probably a little bit quicker than that I would be doing that normally. So I'm just trying to demonstrate the, the method. And <coughs> there we have a nice lob worm. And the best thing about this bait not just that he catches fish, but they're free. <laughs> well, we've picked up about 20, 25 lobworms there in, uh, in just a few minutes. You need to be able to pick up something in the region of uh, several hundred. And if we're going to do a lot of ground baiting, 600 plus. It just takes a little bit of time, and like everything else, a little bit of a knack as to how to do it. But there they are and they're free. An excellent eel bait in most situations. Now we've collected our worms and the thing we must do is to try and keep them in tip-top condition. Now just left in a container in the shed in the warm summer months the chances are they'll go off within three or four days. So the thing to do is first of all give them a good uh, washing in uh, cold water, a good rinsing. Select the full worms or the full worms and discard the broken ones and then transfer them into something like this. Now this is a straightforward polystyrene box and in it we put some damp moss and in a container like this we could probably put two to four hundred worms and they'll last in the fridge for three, four weeks, but by that time we're going to be using them. So put them in the moss, in the box, and put the box in the fridge. Keep it 
nice and cool and those worms will last for a fair while. But when we come on to actually go fishing, the best container to put them in, rather than bait boxes or whatever, is a canvas bucket. And instead of the moss, we could use mashed up paper, damp newspaper. However, that's a second choice. Again, if you can, use fresh moss that's slightly damp. And the eels will keep in there for uh, a lot better than they will in, in anything else that you're likely to put them in, any plastic tins and things like that. So there we are, having got the worms, we looked after them well, and hopefully they're gonna do the job for us when we take them fishing. That's that's what I find is, is time well spent rather than just picking up a hundred for hook baits. You need to you need to concentrate on the ground bait. The maggots really they're just a bit of a filler to try and attract other fish in. Although obviously the eels will eat them, they, they do like they do like maggots as well. And they're small items of food, they're likely to be looking for them. Now somebody's gonna ask me, or somebody's gonna say, why worms? Why not just put a couple of dead baits out there? Well, on a, on a water like this, the eels are very, very, uh, seem to be more preoccupied in eating smaller food items, such as probably pea mussels, a little bit of crustaceans, this type of thing. Give them a big dead bait, or even a smallish dead bait, and quite often they don't even recognize it as an item of food. They will simply bypass it. I have spent countless hours in the past using dead baits, half baits, full baits, small baits, big baits, on a water like this, and for the hours that I've spent on them, I've, I've had practically nil return. So with me on a water like this now, it is worms and maggots, which are my staple, staple baits. I won't say I, I will never use a dead bait again, um, but it's just really as a second as a second line when things aren't going too well. Be basically because they just don't work the same. I would be looking at other waters where dead baits do work well, hopefully, and uh, and, ho and there you will see the, the difference um, in the type of eel that is taking taking the bait. And I hope to be able to demonstrate that with the difference between the eels from this water and a, and a water where whereby they do predominantly take fish baits. Feels like a good one. Oh yes, that's a good fish, that one. Feel him now, just taking some line off. Oh. He's moving just a little bit to the right hand side. Oh, that'll just give him a little bit of line there. Oh, goodness gracious. Better get that net ready in a minute. Ah. Oh. Oh. That feels like a good fish.
That is one big chunk of eel. Oh, that is something else. Look at that for a fish. Absolutely amazing fish. Oh. A real log. Get the scales. Found nine ounce. That is one big chunk of it. Oh goodness gracious. The girth on that. Oh that is something else. Absolutely amazing fish. A real log. A sunfish that is. That is really nice eel. Thank you. You're a beautiful fish. Well, it's a beautiful evening and we've come here uh, to a Shropshire Mere and we're going to look on this session on eel fishing in the margins. Now it's, this is very much a one-shot method. It's been the most successful method that uh, I personally have ever come across for catching big eels but as I said before it's a one-shot session. The chances are if you catch an eel it will be a big one but having said that the blanks far outnumber the successful nights. Now what happens is that on an overcast warm night like tonight, the eels tend to move right into the shallows looking for food items. Now these could be small fish, uh, re really small fry, uh, crustaceans, insects, all whatever, and uh, they move right up against the banks. Now what we should be doing is to try and intercept some of these eels as they come into the shallows to feed. And we'll be looking at the sort of areas that uh, we would expect the eels to, to come into and then showing how we put some ground bait around there, which in this case will be some worms and some maggots, and then dropping the rod, hopefully to intercept them as they come along the banks to feed. So that's what we're gonna be looking at on this particular session. If we just have a look again, at the sort of equipment that we're going to be using. Margin fishing, by the definition, we're going to be fishing amongst snags. Roots, lilies, all sorts of manner of debris which is collected in the side. Now, once an eel is hooked, if it finds sanctuary in them, you're in trouble. So it's very much a, 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 a strong tackle affair um, to try and move them out. So what we've got here is quite a strong uh, two and a half pound test curve carp rod, 11 pound silk cast line, and uh, with that we can do some business. In fact, I think they say they tow, uh, they tow oil rigs out with 11 pound silk cast line. Size 8 hook, and uh, probably something like double lob for bait, right in the margins. Now, just to show you how close, I'm going to take you to one of the spots 
that I've caught eels from uh, fairly recently. Now here's the sort of ideal, the ideal margin swim. We've got lots of tree roots here, old dead branches from where this tree fell in. Now it's quite shallow water, probably only three foot deep, three or four foot deep over soft mud. Now, the now if I go out and walk on there, now I can probably see all the bottom and that, there certainly won't be any signs of fish there. But this is the sort of area that that big eel will move into uh, of a night time. Now forget the fish in there once it gets light. It's very much uh, a nighttime pursuit margin eel fishing. Once it does get light, then the eels will tend to fade away and drop into the deeper water. But this is where I would expect them to be coming probably half an hour, an hour after it gets dark into this area. So what I would do here was set up a rod. I'd try and find just an area where there wasn't any snags and just move the bait into that sort of location. But you can see that once I'd hooked one, that it's very much in the lap of the gods whether I got it out, because once he gets round into that, uh, all that tangle of undergrowth, I'm in trouble. This is why we need strong gear to keep them away from that sort of uh, terrain. But this is where they're going to be, this is where they're going to feed, hopefully this is where we're going to catch them. Let's have a go at that other one up there. Another ideal location for the margin eels to move into. As you can see, it'd be quite difficult to fish. We've got overhanging branches. We've got uh, all these reeds here. We don't clear them out, obviously. We simply try and slip the rod in amongst them. Now, the big problem is, even with a bite alarm on, we're not going to be able to fish right behind the rods. We're going to have to go a little bit further back on the bank uh, for the bivy or the bed chair and wait for some form of life there. Now that does two things, it takes us away from where the eels are, are feeding, where we're obviously going to disturb them if we make any sort of noise at all, and uh, gives them a far better chance to move into the area without any disturbance at all. This particular spot here, a few years ago, uh, produced a very good eel for me, uh, of um, four and a half pounds, and I'm quite confident that since that time nobody's fished it. I mean, as you can see for yourself, I don't think there's been many people here, certainly for the last few seasons anyway. This is one of the essential things, trying to find somewhere where probably the anglers have bypassed the jungle, the type of jungle terrain that we're in at the moment. Now if I was fishing this particular swim tonight, this is the sort of uh, range that I would be, be feeding it at. I'll just... About five, six foot deep there, and I know from the past experiences it's over some soft mud. A little bit deeper towards the end of that tree there. So that's the sort of area I'd be fishing, put, probably putting the rod in this sort of position here. Now, around it, I'd drop something like 25 lobworms, probably putting them out in the line, um, and uh, a good amount of maggots as well, trying to intercept any eels that was moving along the bank. And this is what they do, they tend to move along, and we're trying to intercept them, keep them in the area long enough to find our hook bait, and hopefully take that. Right, here's the chosen spot for tonight. Uh, just be, now we've got the tree branches and the reeds close there, probably a couple of three foot of water, and a chance that the eels will be coming right in on this spot. So I'll be setting up just down here. So we're going to position 
a bait just out there and then throw some worms out at it. So let's just put the bait on. Probably about a half an hour till it goes dark. Choose a couple of lobs. Nice big worms there. Nice and lively. And now the problem, obviously, of casting in. And that's ideal, except we're up the tree. give them some free offerings round about the area. Toss these in by hand, easy enough. Don't need a bolt to ground bait. Two more. And some maggots in a minute. Now, a big problem, obviously, is once you hook an eel in this situation, then if you've done something silly like leave your landing net just a bit few yards behind you, you've got problems. So when the bite alarm goes off, you advance with the landing net. And basically, don't be afraid of getting too wet because you've got to go down there to tackle a fish and to net it because you'll just not draw it through this type of terrain. But there's the ambush set. All we want now is the eel. <coughs> Slightly different bite alarm setup for this because it's just going to be the one rod that we're using. Uh, in one opening. Uh, different bar again and different setup. And this screws it into there. The same gripper alarm that we've used previously and shown previously. And uh, connected up. Just uh, there. And that goes onto the bank stick. And that's the job done. Oh, he's taking the line well there. He'll get two big lobworms on, so let him go. Sounds like an eel, this one. Not another one of them horrible little pike. Oh, it feels like a fair fish, then. Just getting near those weeds, though. Oh, I think it's got me under something now. Oh, sodding hell. Oh, it's been grating. Oh, the line's all chaffed. It's been grating under some stones. Oh, what a shame. Felt like a good fish, that. Never mind. Let's tattle up and try again.
lovely warm evening developed into quite a wet and very cold night and results were rather disappointing. Well, never mind about that. Uh, this is a good method and one uh, that's caught me more big eels than all the other methods put together. I'll just show you what I did catch. As well as that early eel, we caught a little pike. Now it's a good idea to retain, if you do catch these pike this size, to retain them because if you unhook them, put them straight back, they're straight back on the ground bait again and all your hard earned lobs, they're uh, very good at devouring. You can see he's coughed up one or two there in the net and uh, it takes an awful lot of lobworms to fill up a very small, even a very small pike like that. But now we'll put him, we'll put him back again, in fact we'll put them both back again. <sighs> Well, that's margin eel fishing. We've just spent one night on it. Unfortunately, the conditions weren't really in a favour. One eel, about two pound, small jack pike and one lost eel. But I hope that gives you a little bit of flavour of what you can achieve here. It's not easy and you've got to spend some time on it, but it's certainly the one of the most profitable ways of catching big eels that I know. And it's one that, in effect, that I've caught more big eels than any other, all, well, all the other methods put together. So find somewhere of the water like this, similar type of terrain where you, uh, in a water where eels do, do exist and where eels do grow big and uh, you're halfway there. Give it a try. I'm sure you'll find that uh, that method's well worthwhile. We've come to Banner Lake in North Wales. Now, this will be a good opportunity to show uh, dead baits fishing for eels. Now, this particular water has got good access for eels. And there's two or three streams running in and two or three running out. So we get a lot of elvers, a lot of small eels running in, and there's lots of small fish food fodder for the eels to eat. Now we've got a lot, big resident population of perch, roach, some grayling, and don't forget the eels themselves, which, the small eels themselves, which form a food for the, for the bigger eels. Now if we put lobworms on out here, within minutes they get ripped to bits by the smaller bootlace eels. So as a bait for the bigger fish, they're not really on. We need a, a bait, or a dead bait, that's big enough to deter the very small eels from taking it. So what we're going to look at is using different types of baits here, uh, different types of dead baits. Now then, the eels in here tend to be of the big mouth variety. They develop these big heads for taking the quite chunky perch that are to be found. And the normal sequence of events are, certainly in this lake, because the water temperature tends to be on the cool side through the summer, that the eels probably only eat every two, three, four days. And they come on the feed during the night time, and they pick up normally live baits, although we're going to fish for them with dead baits. And they take the probably one, two perch, or, what, or roach, and then they'll sit up and, uh, and digest that food. So it's going to be probably every three or four days that they actually come on the feed. So pre-baiting and ground baiting for them doesn't really work. Not over certainly a period of two or three weeks anyway, without putting it in over that, over that sort of period. I've never found it to work to any degree on this particular lake. It's more a question of find a location where you think the eels are and then position the baits and I hope that the eels will, will find them and pick them up, which they normally do. It's also very much a nighttime pursuit. We're coming here, setting up before it goes dark. We're going to catch whatever eels we're going to catch through the, the dark hours. First thing in the morning, then your chances of catching any more disappear. And, uh, and all the times that I fish this lake, 
The only eels I've ever caught in the daylight have been the very small ones uh, on maggots and this type of thing when you're looking to catch the, the food bait, the, the bait for, for the eels, the, the small perch and the, and the roach. So it's very much a dead bait pursuit, very much a nighttime pursuit. If we have a look at the, the tackle that we're going to use, and fit, uh, then we'll see that it's very much on the heavy side. It's well away from what we used on the canals and, and indeed what we, we used on the, on the lakes in the previous sequences. Normally consists of 15 pound silk cast line and use of wire traces because these eels are equipped with lots of teeth and they'll bite through the nylon that we've used in other, in other areas. So we, we're going to use wire traces. 15 pound silk cast, very heavy tackle, a lot of rocks and chance of getting snagged up. So a lot of abrasiveness on the rocks, hence the very heavy gear. Same sort of rod, two pound test curve, the big Mitchell 306 again, but a heavier line, 15 pound. Now if we look at the, the business end of the gear, I'll just get that sorted out a little bit. Then we're still onto the seconda reeds. And if I show this one here, this is a normal one with a clip, American style clip at the bottom, which has been fixed in there and all dighted in, and the swivel at the at the top there. That is threaded on the line, like so. A bead, nice bright orange one so we can see it easily in this situation for demonstration. A drennan ring which stops it and then a short length again of heavy nylon line. And I get it right and a clip, a clip there to clip the trace on. Now then, before we actually position the bait, that nylon trace there, that nylon trace there has got to be the same length as the trace that we're using the bait on. Otherwise, we tend to get tangles. Don't just use the trace for the whole of the distance, because again, it will tangle. For some reason, perhaps, uh, not really known to myself, this is the best rig, it comes back without tangling up. So remember to keep that trace the same length as the trace on the, on the bait, round about the same length. And of course, on there, we attach the ledger. Very strong, very strong undercurrents, and wind, which gets up, drifting weed, we've got all sorts of problems, if this starts to move along the bottom, the chances are it gets, it'll get a hung up. So what we need is a big weight. Now this is about ounce and three quarters, two ounces. So you're going to need that type of weight um, to make it work really well. Any lighter, the chances are it's going to drift out of position and probably tangle in the rocks. So there's that setup, and then all we do is to clip, clip the bait. Onto that, onto that clip swivel there. Make sure it's secure, and that would be, that then is ready to go. So you can see the setup there. The ledger, that little piece of nylon line, same thickness as the, the main line, and then the wire trace. Now we mentioned wire traces. If you don't use them, the chances are that are big, certainly the bigger eels are going to bite through the, the nylon. There's all kinds of trace materials on the market now. Uh, quite a lot of the pike, the pike ones do the job quite well. The Drennan certainly, uh, Marlin steel, any of those. And instead of tying a treble on, we would use a single hook. Now if I just remove this one here, we can see it's a size 2 Jack Hilton type carp hook, a really big hook, which it needs to be and a bait like that, because otherwise it can be masked by the bait, especially when the eel takes it, it tends to squash it up, and I'll show you exactly what I mean a little bit later as to what's happened with the bait that we've had out previously. Now then, we'll come on to the different types of baits 
I'll take that one off. Come on to the different types of baits that, that I'll be using on this trip. <sighs> now the lake, in all the, around the whole length of the lake, we've got perch. They live on the ledges and they're the most abundant fish, I think, in the hula of the lake. They're the ones that the eels seem to pick out most. Now then, we've caught a small one and we've halved it. Half baits seem to work, again, a lot better than full baits on this particular lake. So that's what we're going to use on one of the rods. Uh, a half perch and the, the, the uh, single hook attached there at the top. The second bait, again a roach from, from the lake, although it's drying up a little bit now, that we caught previously. Again on a wire trace, but we're going to fish that one hole. Again, a nice small bait, on the sort of bait that in majority of waters would be your first choice. And the last one is a small eel section. Now, when you get waters overcrowded with small eels, then some of the bigger eels will become cannibal. And an eel section is the most is the best way of picking them out. In fact, I think they go predominantly as a as a cannibal fish. And my idea is that they, they don't actually feed on, on anything else. They'll just take the eel section, or they just take normally take eels naturally in the water. So we're going to use this eel, small eel section here. Now that looks a big bait, quite a big bait for any eel to have, but only a few years ago when fishing in Ireland, I was fishing a section of five ounce eel and I caught on it a five ounce eel. So that they will, they develop these huge heads on them and they are really distinctive and that they just feed, in my opinion, on, on the eel sections, on, the, on, on eels. Now on all but the most still nights, it's important that we get the rods fairly well into the water. Now it's a gradual sloping bank here, so we need to take them quite well out. Possibility of waders, get them a little bit further. Now this is important for a number of reasons. One, we've got a very heavy undertow on the water. And secondly, so we're trying to beat that, we've got the winds which lash out at the rods and and can upset the setup. And the last point we've got some weed here. Now this has just appeared over the last few years. Drifts along, catches on the surface of the water and catches on the line. And of course this just builds up over a period of time and uh, can set off the alarms. So get them quite well out into the water like this. Sink the rod tops right down, like this one here, sink it right down into the water. This is more the setup under the conditions as, we've see, as we see of them now, which is quite reasonable. If it's really blowing, we want the rod right down into the water, and that seems to cut down the number of missed runs and, on it. Now, on the bite alarm setup here, We've got the lines clip, clipped in. When it's blowing and heavy undertow, sometimes we need a little bit of assistance. So we'll be looking at using a line clip like this. Now, all that happens with this is it's just that little bit of extra protection. You stick the line in there and it just takes the initial impact of the weed and the wind and the undertow. And then we connect up to the bite alarm as we've got it here. So if I just switch on and demonstrate when the eel takes easily enough to pull it out of there and out of the back one as well and away she goes. Easier if you've got it switched on. Let's just try that one. Right. Something to miss with this one at the minute. There we go. Let me just demonstrate that again. Now this line clip on the front here, that will take the main 
part of the undercurrents and the toes and the bit of weed that sticks on the line. When the eel takes, it should pull out of that one simply and away she goes, leaving the, the line free to play off the reel and obviously giving us an indication of a bite. So occasionally you do get the odd false alarm, but um, that's just something you've got to live with. Most important thing, get the rods forward, get the rod tips well down into the, into the water and that way you can beat most of the drift, most of the tow and most of the weed. Now the most obvious areas, locations uh, to look for the eels would be on the shallow waters where the small fish are. But unfortunately they are not the areas that seem to produce the fish here. The one place that I found that fishes really well is to fish just off the deep drop-offs. Now these can be located with the echo sounder and once you've found a good area where the, you've got some good ledges where the water depth alters dramatically then put the marker in and fish to them. Now these are quite often some distance out from the bank and certainly in this location they're probably in the region of 80 to 100 yards out depending on the, the height of the lake at the time. Can't cast that far with the, 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 those setups that I've got so the answer is to position it from the baits from the boat. A little bit stronger boat than the inflatable that we've been using in the past. A lot safer, quite honestly, going out in this. Still wear the old life jacket mine. Somebody to hold the rod, to let the line off the reel and row out to the position required and drop the bait in. Superb way of getting the baits in exactly the right place and uh, one that I find very beneficial on this water. Now sometimes we're fishing 55, 60 foot of water which wouldn't, as I say, wouldn't seem to be the sort of area that we were going to catch fish. But not only do we catch eels at that depth, it might surprise a lot of people, we can pick up pike at that depth as well. And uh, so we're fishing exactly the same sort of areas for the pike in the daytime as we are for the eels of a night time. Whenever you're using boats for either ground baiting or positioning bait, always wear a life jacket. I can't stress this more strongly. Unfortunately, earlier this year, there was a tragic accident in which one angler died using a small inflatable boat. Now, whenever I use the boats, I'm going out in an infl a life jacket and also make sure that you can swim. It's 80 yards out in some cold water, you could be in serious trouble if the boat uh, topples over or the wind catches it wrong. So get geared up. No fish, whatever size, is worth your life. So make sure you've got the right equipment on. Simple as that. session on Bala this time and unfortunately it was a very poor night uh, heavy winds a lot of rain really uncomfortable it's not always like that it is one of the nicest places certainly now look at it now it's a beautiful day but as regards the eel fishing it was quite poor first of all I had a take on one of the perch sections and that's what happened as a result you can see how it, the bait's been so smashed and what happened to it is that the, the hook point actually got masked in all this flesh there and when I struck the couple of shakes of the rod and it came free. So I lost that one, not to worry, which is what I was mentioning, what we're talking about, that was what I was mentioning before about having a big hook 
This is why size two certainly isn't too big for a bait of that description. The only other take of the night resulted in a very small eel. Um, it's probably not even a pound weight, and but from what I mentioned before about the eel's predator role in the lake, I hope this one will, will demonstrate it because he's just coming out of the Elvis stage, if you like, of the small bootlace size, and it's just started to develop those characteristic big flat heads of uh, the predator type of eel. So if you have a look closely here while he's upside down and a little bit subdued, you can see the great big head in relationship to its body. That eel took that bait and it had it quite easily and it could have even taken a bigger bait. And you can see it is a, a really small fish, a small eel wise. Have a look at it. I've left the trace on by the way, which will obviously cut off in a little minute, in a minute or two. But there's on the head side, um, you can see the, the very distinctive big flat heads for taking baits of that bit, that size and even bigger. And that's what that eel's been feeding on. And when we take away the trace, probably what he'll continue to feed on. I hope from that you can see the difference between our previous eels, the eels from the lakes where the heads were nowhere near as pronounced, and where a bait like that would have simply been ignored. Here, a different story. That eel will probably take a worm, but he'll probably not get near it because the bootlace will have beaten to it long before he, long before he gets there. Not that he's much more than the bootlace himself, to be honest. But never mind. I hope that demonstrates the point with it. Once the light gets up, certainly like this, you can forget the eels at Bala Lake. They only feed during the night time, or certainly that's what I've found, except obviously for the very small ones. And it's a nighttime pursuit. So what happens normally during the day is we take the eel rigs off, we put a pad of noster on, and we go for the pike. Now they can be good fun as well. But we could only spend one night at Bala Lake, and unfortunately that's produced one, just one very small eel. But don't let that put you off. There's certainly loads of good fish here at Bala Lake. Well worth a try. Sometimes the elements are against you, and the high winds and rain, etc. But it's well worth tackling. Come and try it for pike as well. That's what we're doing now, and hopefully we'll salvage the trip with a couple of nice pike. <laughs>